Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Katie Chrome. I'm currently a non-resident fellow with the Middle East Institute's Defense and Security Program, and also a resident student at the U.S. Army War College right now up in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. I'm pleased to moderate today's panel, Beyond Post-Desert Storm, the Future of U.S.-Kuwait Security Partnership. Today, we're gonna to discuss the role Kuwait plays in U.S. military plans within the Middle East, and also the future of U.S. regional defense posture, and mostly security cooperation as well. We're joined today by a very distinguished panel, starting with Bilal Saab, Senior Fellow and the Director of the Defense and Security Program here at MEI, Stacey Pettyjohn, a Senior Fellow and Director of the Defense Program at CNAS, and General Retired just a couple weeks ago, Michael Garrett, the former Commanding General of U.S. Army Forces Command, and importantly, U.S. Army Central, which oversees all Army forces within the Middle East. Today's webinar will last for about an hour. The chat function is gonna be closed during the webinar, but questions for the panel can be submitted either through the Q&A function on Zoom or by emailing events at mei.edu. For those of you tuning in via YouTube or MEI's website, please note this webinar is being recorded and you can rewatch it later online at mei.edu. Thanks so much for joining us today. You hope, we hope you check out our other events this week, especially on September 26th. Join us for a dialogue with former CENTCOM Commander, General Retired Frank McKenzie. To register for this and to see all our events, please visit our website. Lastly, these opinions are personal and do not reflect the Department of Defense. So we're gonna start with Bilal, who just wrote an incredible paper on Kuwait and US security cooperation and partnership. Um, we're going to start with going over that in detail, and then at the end, we're going to come back with a couple of very difficult questions for you in the audience. Over to you, Bilal. Thank you, Katie. It's an absolute honor to be with uh, Stacy and uh, my good friend, Mike uh, Garrett. Uh, before I say a word, I just want to thank three people, if you don't mind, uh, who really were very helpful to me as I was researching uh, for this paper. Uh, United States Air Force uh, Brigadier General Darren Slayton, who's currently serving as our SDO DAT in uh, Kuwait. Uh, Brian uh, Hilferty, uh, retired colonel, uh, who is a strategic communications advisor with RCENT, uh, very helpful as well. And of course, right here on this very panel, uh, Michael Garrett. Uh, I'll be honest, it, it wasn't easy to gather uh, military data on uh, Kuwait or insights on Kuwait. Uh, and believe me, I tried really hard to speak to Kuwaiti military personnel to get the perspectives. I even try to have someone actually represented on this panel from the Kuwaiti Armed Forces or the Ministry of Defense, but um, my efforts failed. So I'm gonna to try to preempt some criticism uh, possibly by saying to whoever's watching Kuwait or elsewhere, uh, that this conversation we're having this morning, uh, you, know, you know, naturally it's going to be uh, um, focused on the US perspective, uh, uh, this is what I'm going to talk about. This is what Stacy and Mike are going to talk about. So there's just going to be some bias, some limitations to that, but hopefully that's still useful. Okay. So now that I've gotten uh, that off my chest, let me place this story in its proper strategic context. Um, if you ask me, what are the chances uh, today or sometime in the future of us going to war against Iran? I'd say not very high, not very low. Uh, not very high because no one in the right mind would advocate for going to war against Iran, okay? Not very low because we have many problems and we have many tensions with the Iranians. They have American blood on their hands. We have Iranian blood on our hands. There's a history of mistrust, history of crises. We fought in the 80s, all of that. And if the nuclear talks today don't succeed, I think those war chances are going to go up. I promise you, I'll tell you why I'm talking about this in a minute. The second uh, threat that I'm thinking of in the region is a possible resurgence of ISIS or another terrorist army. High chances, low chances, to be honest, I have no clue. But what I do know is that we have a ticking time bomb in Syria, uh, and General Carrillo knows this. If those ISIS detainees somehow escape or we don't find an adequate solution to that miserable camp, that terrorist problem is just not going to stay in Syria. It's going to metastasize and it's going to spill over. So why am I bringing up these two contingencies? Because it means that even though we left Afghanistan, even though we transitioned in Iraq from a combat mission to one that's focused on advising and assisting the Iraqi partner forces, and even though we keep saying that we want to avoid endless wars in the Middle East, which by the way, there's nothing wrong with that, the reality is that there's still a chance that we actually might have to fight again in that part of the world. So to me, the only question 
that matters is not whether we're going to fight again in the Middle East, it's how we are going to fight. And I don't mean what operations we're going to launch. I don't mean what weapon systems we're going to use. I mean, what is our strategic approach to war fighting in the Middle East going to be? It's crystal clear to me, at least, that we're not going to fight alone. We don't want to fight alone. Operation Desert Storm was a long time ago. And Operation Inherent Resolve is not the model either. Neither was Afghanistan, even though some good came out of those two campaigns in terms of partner contributions. So what we need and what we need to work on and what General Carrilla is working on is a credible collective approach to deterrence and defense, and if need be, to coalition war fighting, to collective war fighting. These partners have to fight with us. As former Secretary of Defense Ash Carter once said at the height of the anti-ISIS campaign, these partners need to put more skin in the game. So I don't just mean access and basing, as important as these enablers are, I mean coalition fighting. Because when deterrence fails, and it has failed several times in the Middle East, and when defense is unsustainable, and you're getting attacked with cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, drones, you're getting assaulted by ISIS fighters, you need to incorporate the element of the offense into your strategy. And that simply means that you have to fight. So coalition fighting obviously requires many things, but at least two basic things, a willing partner and a capable partner. Willing partner meaning that they actually want to fight. Capable partner meaning actually that they know how to fight, that they are actually militarily effective. Kuwait, which is the topic of our conversation today, is not exactly a partner that is willing to fight. It has espoused neutrality. It has espoused a sort of an independent foreign policy that is more focused on mediation, kind of like the Omanis. And so they're not, it is not really in their DNA. It's not in their constitution unless there's a conflict that directly affects their national security, which is why they were not a very active participant in the anti-ISIS campaign or in any other contingency in the region. OK, now we can't force the Kuwaitis to fight. OK, but the Kuwaitis should know that if they don't want to be an active part of a collective approach to regional security, which is what CENTCOM is working on right now, then and this is difficult for me to say, but I'm as always, I'm blunt. OK, so they're going to be a less attractive partner to us down the road. OK, that's why I titled my paper Beyond post-desert storm. So the post-desert storm uh, part of the title is basically that phase where we built up our access and basing after the 1990s, right? After Operation Desert Storm, in large part, thanks to Kuwait, right? We got 13,000 people in Kuwait right now, and they were instrumental in our expansion of our military presence across the region. That's the post-desert storm phase. I want to go beyond that phase, meaning that I don't want to just park the car in Kuwait. I want Kuwait to drive the car with me, right? And so we have to elevate security cooperation beyond the access and basing with the Kuwaitis. And by the way, I'm not picking on the Kuwaitis. This applies to every single other partner of ours. We have to move beyond this access and basing of security cooperation and really try to get into the issues of collective security. Now, it's never going to formalize into collective defense the way we understand it in NATO, of course, but a more collective approach to regional security that actually incorporates the element of coalition fighting, okay? The old model has expired. We need a new model that actually incorporates the military capabilities of our partners into our contingency planning. Now, I could spend hours talking about how do you achieve military effectiveness, okay? We're not gonna do that today. I spent a good bit of that talking about it in my book, Rebuilding Arab Defense. But what I want to say here that it's extremely hard to be an effective fighting force if you're not a joint force. Okay. And Kuwait is not a joint force, not just Kuwait, but most of our, frankly, I would say almost all of our Arab partners are not joint forces. So what they need to do first and foremost is to try to start this process of implementing defense reforms, structural reforms that gets them into uh, a joint force that makes them actually a joint force, okay? They are now what we were pre-Goldwater Nichols, okay? They fight as services. And that makes you inherently vulnerable. If I'm your enemy and I know you're not a joint force, first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go after one of your services and cripple you, ideally your Air Force, 
okay? If you're a joint force, I can't do that, or at least it's very difficult for me to do that. That's what the Kuwaitis need to understand. And so we need to help them better organize their command structures. We need to basically create this um, North Star for them to basically help them with resource planning, with operational planning, all of that stuff that starts really on a conceptual level, on a philosophical level, which has, which has to be written very simply in a capstone document, right? That defines the missions of the military, what's your joint war fighting concept, how do you do steady state operations in phase zero and beyond. All of those things, they have to start and they have to start from scratch for the Kuwaitis. And we have a moral, and strategic responsibility to help them with those things. Let's talk about specifics later, Katie, and thank you for your patience, but I cannot wait to hear what Stacy and uh, Mike have to say about this. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Bilal. You give us a lot to look forward to later in the panel. Um, General Garrett, over to you with a couple of questions first. So in your you know, almost 40 year illustrious career, I know one of the highlights for you was commanding US Army Central Command, which for the civilians out there, he was in charge of all army forces across the over 20 nations in the Middle East. Can you talk to us, sir, about a couple of things? First, just your relationship, your personal relationship with the Kuwaiti military leadership. And secondly, how you saw over your career Kuwait evolve as a military. Yeah, thanks, Katie. And, you know, it's uh, interesting that you asked the question. Your former boss, General Hotel, when he took over uh, CENTCOM, I think it was about two, three months into the job, and he remarked to me that, you know, Mike, I now understand the importance of Army Central and our responsibilities to just about everything that happens uh, in the uh, in the Middle East. Um, you know, my impression, my initial impression, like many of us, you know, many military people have landed in Kuwait, hopped on a bus with the drapes pulled over the windows, drove to some staging base, uh, you know, prepared for either movement north uh, or some other place. Uh, and that was the basis of my impression until uh, I assumed command of Arsene and spent a lot of time uh, in Kuwait. Um, you know, I visited the region 42 times in 42 months of command. And on every one of those trips, with maybe a couple of exceptions, I visited Kuwait. Um, I had a very personal relationship with uh, and remain and, and maintain that relationship with uh, then the land force commander, uh, my dear friend Khalid al Sabah, uh, who is now the uh, commander of, of their military. And their military reflects really uh, the leadership. Um, it is a very professional uh, military, um, you know, as Bilal highlighted in his paper, you know, like many of the other Middle Eastern countries, they invested heavily in U.S. equipment. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time uh, training with and alongside uh, of the Kuwaitis. Um, but, you know, Kuwait's a small country. It's got a small military. And Kuwait has been, uh, and I think will always remain a very special partner uh, to the United States and the military because of, and although Bilal, you said, you know, the, the access and basing and the other, the things that allow, that the Kuwaitis allow us to do, um, I, you know, I, I will tell you that, you know, every country acts in their best interests. Uh, I think Kuwait has been consistent um, in terms of their approach. Um, you know, so although their military is not very big, uh, they have always chosen the United States as their primary military partner, uh, and they have treated us very, very well. You know, Bilal, you said that, uh, you know, during the uh, uh, counter ISIS, you know, campaign, they did not provide fighters. That's true. But I tell you what, uh, the basing uh, out of Kuwait, um, you know, was unparalleled in terms of support by anybody else in the region. The other thing about Kuwait is Kuwait uh, has been a very um, uh, reliable ally. And when I say reliable, they haven't changed. You know, I spent time in every country in the region. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time in uh, Abu Dhabi. I spent a lot of time in Saudi Arabia. I spent a lot of time in Qatar and Jordan and Egypt. And I tell you what, all of those countries, uh, as our politics changed, 
you know, the relationship between the United States and those countries changed. Uh, it never changed in Kuwait, ever. They were the most reliable partner that we had. Uh, and although, as Bilal stated uh, in his opening comments, uh, you know, they're very careful. But I tell you what, they have always supported us. So, you know, my sense with the uh, Kuwaiti military is that, um, you know, they will continue to grow. They will continue to evolve. Uh, but it will be, you know, on their timeline and it will be uh, in their best interests. Thanks so much. That was, that was super comprehensive. Stacey, if we can go over to you for a minute just to bring the conversation um, up one level in terms of just the rationale for security cooperation overall. You know, General Garrett referred to not only the partnerships, access basing and overflight and the, the reasons for posturing there. But can you talk to us about, in general, why is security cooperation important? Maybe kind of define it for the audience um, and what you think we need to do in the future to kind of bol bolster our relationship with Kuwait in particular. Thanks, Kitty. Um, yeah, I mean, security cooperation is something that we have been doing for decades, and it, but it's been really closely tied to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, I think, in most recent people's memory. And if we think more broadly and put it in the lexicon of the time, or at least the lexicon of the current administration, it should be a critical component of integrated deterrence and the national defense strategy, um, which we only have a page and a half fact sheet thus far, but is supposed to be released the unclassified version soon. Allies and partners play an incredibly important role in that strategy. And the key piece of that is the uh, ability to work with them, which is pretty holistic. It's not just foreign military financing or foreign military sales or exercises. It involves everything from soup to nuts that we do in terms of strategy uh, planning, operational planning, you know, working on building defense institutions up, which Bilal has advocated for in his paper. Um, and uh, this is something that we actually still need to focus on just in a different respect than we have done in the past. When we were undertaking security cooperation for a lot of the expeditionary operations in Afghanistan and Iraq, at least from a U.S. perspective, um, we were preparing and helping people to fight, you know, and to conduct counterterrorism or counterinsurgency operations. Now we want to be trying to develop more of a capability where frontline allies and partners are going to have the capability and the capacity to respond effectively with as a part of a coalition, but with perhaps the United States um, in the background a little bit more than it was in uh, the last few decades. Thanks so much, Stacey. This actually brings us kind of back to something Bilal mentioned in his opening comments. And when you talk about building defense institutions and the importance of that, you know, it's not just about equipment, it's really kind of changing what an operational headquarters looks like, what a strategic headquarters with and how works with and how a joint force actually fights. Bilal, I know you talk about um, developing something like a capstone document that the Kuwaiti military could use as their basis going forward, something that looks like our national defense strategy kind of mixed with our global force management, which is how we employ forces overseas. Can you talk a little bit about what you mean by that? I think you're muted. Okay, I was muted. I'm going to say it again. This ties very nicely to one of the questions um, that I can see here on the chat function by Ali Ashur, who is a lieutenant commander from the Kuwaiti Mar Maritime Security Sector. So, uh, and by the way, I'm super impressed with the Kuwaiti Navy, who have now led CTF 152 five times and currently also leading it. Um, so talk about, talk about being an active member, at least in the maritime domain. So look, um, I'm aware that the Kuwaitis have a national military strategy. It is uh, most likely classified, um, but I, um, I'm aware that it's there and that it has, it's quite useful and uh, not all of our partners have this kind of document. But what I have in mind is something a little bit different, something that really gets us into the specifics of what we call and what everybody else should call uh, ends, ways, and means, right? To the specifics of how actually you're going to be achieving very clear specified missions of the military. 
Um, so phase zero and beyond um, and how you're doing it. So, you know, the Kuwaitis have obviously emphasized that, you know, they need to develop their own self-defense capabilities. And if need be in the event of a contingency, rely on the support of their brothers and the Gulf Cooperation Council. But they, it, it has to go beyond that. It has to go beyond that in terms of how do you really structure your military to become a joint force. And this document, as I mentioned before, is going to be very important, not just for them, but also for us and specifically for CENTCOM, because this, as I mentioned before, this would create a North Star for Kuwait's daily operational planning and future capability resource planning with the Department of Defense's DSCA, which is the Defense Security Cooperation Agency. Now, you and I both know, Katie, um, that CENTCOM has a comm plan for every partner, okay? In the event of a major contingency, major crisis, major attack, there's, there's a comm plan that CENTCOM has. But boy, wouldn't it be useful, wouldn't it be nice if the partner would have um, major contributions to that comp plan and that those would be integrated into that comp plan. So with respect to Kuwait and frankly, every other partner in the region, it's hard to imagine that they would have tangible contributions to that comp plan when you see that they are not as invested in phase zero or in steady state operations. To me, what the Kuwaitis understand as phase zero and frankly, most, once again, most other partners of ours in the region is essentially purchasing equipment. That's what phase zero means to them. It's very little training. It's very little planning. It's very little everything that we do across the dot MLPFB that we do, right? So when you are less prepared for war because you're not investing in phase zero, automatically that means that your contributions when war happens are going to be almost negligible, okay? There is definitely no way I'm going to disagree with Mike on the critical importance of access and basing in Kuwait. Uh, we cannot do many things in the region if the Kuwaitis didn't give us the permissions, the impeccable access, the APS-5 station in Kuwait, I mean, all those things, right? But what I'm arguing is that we are now in a different strategic environment. We are now much more, and Stacy knows this, we are now much more focused on different priority regions, on the Indo-Pacific, and we are now downgrading the region, which means that we have to emphasize a different kind of security cooperation in the region that actually incorporates the military capabilities and the contributions of these partners. So access and basing, by all means, yes, I don't want to lose that, but now I want a little bit more from the partner. And when I want a little bit more from the partner, that means that I want you to fight the same way I fight. If you're not going to fight jointly, then you're not a useful partner to me. We're not going to fight together if you don't fight jointly, okay? And that's what they need to learn. We're going to need to help them become a joint force by organizing their command structures. And I have in mind, and this doesn't have to be the only idea, but my idea is that depending on the, looking at their geography and looking at the critical missions of defense that they have, they can create two joint uh, standing uh, joint force commands. And of course, correspondingly, two different uh, uh, joint force commanders, each directly responsible for different missions. One, and of course, all operating under a, what we call the National Command Authority for the Kuwaitis. So you asked me like who would own that document, National Command Authority in Kuwait. So one mission would be in the Eastern part of the Gulf in the littoral areas, right, right near the water, right? In terms of all the waters of the country. And one across the Northwestern land borders with Iraq. And then what you do is you go to the services and you ask them to feed these two standing joint force commands with your best officers, right? They will go through training, joint, everything has to be joint and all operating under or reporting to Mike's good friend in Kuwait, the commander of the Kuwaiti Armed Forces, Lieutenant General Khaled Al-Sabah, who has passion like no other man I've ever known, right? I mean, oratory skills, crazy. He fires up his soldiers like nobody else. So the bottom line is that if you're not investing in jointness, you're not training jointly, if you're not structured and postured jointly, you're not going to be able to find jointly. And if you can't find jointly, we are not going to fight with you in the same way as we would fight with any other NATO ally. I know it's a very high bar. It's a very high bar. And this is a long term process. But we have to start investing in these, what Stacy has referred to, these defense institution building uh, processes that will enable you to become a joint force. That's the capstone document. You call it whatever you want. doesn't matter. As long as it specifies to me ways, ends, and means. 
Thanks, Bill. You gave a ton of stuff for us to chew on and ask follow-up questions. I think that I'll go over to um, General Garrett now just to address one of them. You know, Bilal brought up the great point of, you know, each of their services is incredibly professional. You know, their pilots are awesome. Their, their standing army is great. And their Navy is bringing things to the, to the fight right now within the maritime community that NAVSINT has never seen before. So, I mean, each service is really knocking it out of the park. General Garrett, what do you think that Kuwait has as a unique capability? What, you know, what is unique about their military when it comes to coalition warfare and, you know, U.S. Kuwait military warfare going forward? What can they bring that perhaps other countries cannot? Uh, great question. And, you know, as Bilal was going through that, there were a number of things that, you know, popped into my mind and, and one, and I hope we get to talk about this um, because I know this is Kuwait specific, but, you know, this recalibration, you know, um, our, our national, you know, defense strategy and Bilal used the word downgrade, I think recalibration, or at least is how I think about it, uh, is important. But here's what I would tell you about the Kuwaiti. So as a force comm commander, uh, the biggest challenge that I had on any given day was not um, armored brigades, was not fires brigades or support brigades. It was air defense. Um, and uh, and this goes back to the Kuwaitis. And, and maybe, you know, Bilal, this is one of those things that, you know, you just don't see uh, on episodic visits or maybe even while you're studying this. But the Kuwaitis hold a very, very special place uh, in the GCC, and they are respected by the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Jordanians. There are very few places where all of those armies will come together to train. Uh, and so I think, one, that is Kuwait's, one of their unique capabilities. Here's the other thing. Uh, when I was, uh, you know, so I think uh, sometime this uh, fall, winter, we're going to hold the World Cup in Qatar. And, you know, five, six years ago, as Qatar rebuilt their whole country, the other thing they did was invest in a whole bunch of air defense, more air defense than they could probably man. Uh, and we were having a problem. We were challenged, you know, meeting their training requirements, given, given our global requirements for air defense. But you know who assisted? And it was because they were respected as having capable air defense forces and the same systems. It was the Kuwaitis. And so when I think about, you know, the, uh, you know, the unique uh, capabilities of Kuwait, there are two things. One, it's a professional military. It's a respected military. And that starts with their boss um, and how he is viewed throughout the region. Uh, and it goes back to their uh, professionalism uh, and their tactical, you know, I know this is bigger than, you know, tactical and operational level warfare, uh, but that's where it all starts, right? Um, I mean, you can't fight joint unless you have capable um, services that are able to execute, you know, uh, the tasks that we ask them to. Thanks for that, General Garrett. Um, Stacy, just over to you to talk a little bit um, about the integrated deterrence national defense strategy that you mentioned. You know, I know integrated deterrence is a is a central point in the NDS that's soon to be released, unclassified, hopefully. Um, and as you alluded to, allies and partners take a central role uh, within the document. Can you talk about, you know, as, as China kind of comes to the forefront in the foreign policy news for the U.S. and obviously Russia now with what's going on between Russia and the Ukraine, how do you see partnerships with the Middle East going forward? Definitely. Um, yeah, we're all waiting with bated breath for the strategy, which uh, has supposedly been done for a long time, but uh, not yet released. But the big uh, component of it is actually largely a continuation of what we had seen with the 2018 NDS with the Trump administration in terms of focusing on great power competition and China and then Russia and uh, trying to divest somewhat or recalibrate, to use Mike's word, at the US's, the US military's involvement in the Middle East and Africa and with other more persistent threats and the type of things that have been taking their attention for a long time. Um, the other point of continuity is allies and partners, which was a big point of emphasis in the 2018 NDS. And I think one of the areas where there was actually the least follow through. And so um, the hope is that with the 2022 NDS, that there's going to be greater specificity about how they're going to integrate allies and partners. Because as Bilal has been talking about, 
you know, it's hard enough to integrate jointly. Um, so across all of the services within one country, but then to plug in allies and partners into that piece. And when the U.S. military is focused on uh, developing very advanced capabilities, ensuring that you, you, you have actual ways to do that and you don't leave them behind is really important. And I think a key part of what um, I believed to be a part of the 2022 NDS is that integrated deterrence with allies and partners is going to help be focusing on helping getting those allies and partners in the less prioritized regions, in addition to the ones that are the most uh, the highest priority uh, to be at the forefront of their own defenses and to be working together collectively, um, not necessarily on their own, but standing more um, in the front than they have been in the past. And that's where security cooperation would come into play and thinking about how you recalibrate the U.S.'s military footprint in the Middle East compared to uh, the other regions, which are a priority. But it, you've heard from the Biden administration officials from the secretary Austin on down that, you know, China is the pacing challenge. They maintain that that has been true since uh, before the invasion of Ukraine. Russia is this acute threat, meaning this urgent one that's time sensitive that they're dealing with right now in Europe. Um, and then you have a whole host of persistent threats that um, are often um, present in other regions like the Middle East. And that might include deterring Iran, dealing with uh, terrorists like Bilal said, sort of the two main missions that you can see in that region. And the Biden administration is looking to find ways to, I think, more efficiently uh, uh, conduct those operations and manage and contain those persistent threats. And so you're seeing this um, manifest in a few different ways. You know, there's there might be some shifts in posture, um, especially as some of the high demand, low density assets are really needed in other region like air defense or armor. Um, but also in terms of coming up with novel uh, solutions, I think you're seeing some innovation in the Middle East and in CENTCOM right now. Um, with naval forces relying on unmanned surface vehicles to do some of the monitoring. And this is pushing uh, the, the need to draw down or the fact that they're expecting to draw down somewhat in the region is pushing them to look for new ways of doing it. They just need to figure out how to include these new technologies and to um, sort of rally, rally allies and partners in the region while doing so. Andy, can I double down on the efficiency yeah. part? Because that's a really key term that Stacey just used. So efficiency for them, them partners, and for us too, right? Because that's the beauty of defense institution building is that it allows you to sustain the assistance that we're providing them, not just to effectively employ it, but to sustain it. And also to allow us to sort of like take a step back a little bit and lean a little bit more on them. That's why this, this process is so crucial because it really contributes not just to effectiveness, but to efficiency as well in an era of redu uh, decreased resources or resources that are going to be used in other priority regions. Perfect. This actually leads, um, leads me to a question for General Garrett. You know, when Stacey and Bilal both mentioned China before, um, you know, I know this administration is deeply concerned about the, the vacuum that we could create in the Middle East, you know, if we um, spread the peanut butter too thin, that China and Russia could both fill that vacuum and something that, you know, no, nobody wants to happen. So can you talk a little bit, General Garrett, about what the U.S. actually uniquely brings to the U.S.-Kuwait relationship in terms of not just equipment, but training and relationships so that, you know, when they're hedging and looking, hey, maybe the U.S. is not you know, going to be a reliable partner for the next 100 years? Do we need to look towards another partner? And do we need to look at Chinese equipment? Do we need to be, look at Russian partnership? You know, what does the U.S. bring to the Kuwait relationship that these other countries can't bring? Yeah, I think it's, you know, I think the, the answer is we bring our values. You know, we bring unique American values. And, you know, when we say we're going to do something, we do it. Uh, and I think that's what the Kuwaitis respect. But, you know, um, Katie talked a little bit about this and, you know, we are talking about Kuwait, but this, 
this, you know, it started with the pivot to the Pacific and then it was, you know, the new national defense strategy. And then it was, you know, CENTCOM, you know, the folks and Katie, you were probably there, woke up one day and CENTCOM was no longer the national defense main effort. Um, and that was a big deal. Uh, and, and I tell you, in my travels throughout the region, it was, and this is why, again, I have, you know, uh, you know, deep and strong feelings for Kuwait, uh, because I'd go to Egypt and, uh, you know, the, they wouldn't talk to us. Uh, I'd go to Saudi Arabia. And although I always had contact with, uh, you know, my interlocutors, uh, but there were still, um, you know, ways for the Saudis to convey uh, and voice their disappointment in some of the political decisions that we were making. Um, the same thing with the Qataris and the Emiratis. Um, you know, what we have done, though, over the last five or six years is we have slowly changed the expectations uh, in the region. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, uh, all of those countries are going to act in their best interest. Uh, all of those countries are going to buy equipment from as many diverse, you know, sources as they can because it makes sense. Um, and it's going to be, you know, really the United States government and then the United States defense industry, quite frankly, you know, to be able to to uh, keep up with all of with all of the demands. I tell you, though, the last thing here is. Um, Eric Carrilla is the right person to be at CENTCOM today. Uh, you know, Eric has a great sense of the challenges, you know, I'm an army guy, so I'm the, that's what I'll speak to, but the challenges that we have in the army meeting global requirements. Um, and, you know, CENTCOM, the, the hard thing with CENTCOM is, you know, it's hard to argue with General McKenzie on more air defense as an example, when he is the only COCOM, uh, you know, that's being shot at by ballistic missiles. You know, those are very, very difficult decisions. Uh, but I tell you what, Eric Carolla has a great understanding of, of uh, what the Army's capabilities are, what the global requirements are. Uh, and uh, I think really, you know, you talk about uh, innovation. He's probably one of the uh, biggest innovators uh, in our Army. And so I'm very excited to see what Eric and, you know, the CENTCOM team does here uh, over the next several years. Yeah, thanks, General Garrett. And that goes right to the point that Bilal was making earlier, just about Kuwait commanding one of the maritime task forces right now. And, you know, the inclusivity of these new sail drones that are being used out there. I mean, they're doing stuff that's um, not occurring anywhere else in the world. And it's pretty powerful. And the fact that Kuwait is involved in that, you know, speaks volumes. Um, Bilal, just over to you with a question. So what do you think Kuwait sees right now as their as their major threat? So as they seek to build, you know, a joint for a force, modernize around the, you know, a capstone document that might come to fruition later. What do you think that almost their friendly and enemy centers of gravity should be? You know, what are they and should they be worried about in the future that they can um, build their force around? Yeah, so this is where, you know, I was hoping that we have a Kuwaiti representative on this panel, but believe me, I tried. So look, but it's, it's no secret. Uh, the the twin threats um, that Kuwait sees are also seen by other partners as well. That's violent extremism in all its forms, right? So another ISIS 2.0 or whatever you want to call it, that's one uh, factor. And Kuwait is not immune to that, right? And then there's the um, uh, Iran threat with all its militias, all its proxies across the region. Kuwait has had to bear the brown of both, right, over the years. So at the height of the ISIS phase, you know, there were some terrorist uh, incidents inside Kuwait. I remember one of them was inside a mosque. Um, and so it, they're not that different, frankly, from what other Gulf countries are facing. Um, and then, then you get everything else as far as, you know, climate change and environmental issues and what have you. Uh, but in terms of Politi there's also a political element to stability. I mean, Kuwait is a fascinating country because unlike any other, it actually has credible particip particip this is a horrible word, participatory politics. That means that there's actually representative government in Kuwait, unlike any other in the region. And others in the region, as far as Gulf monarchies, are 
a little bit apprehensive about the Kuwaiti model because it invites actually so much participation from a wide spectrum of society, including political Islamists and what have you. They actually have a credible parliament. There is who could really voice their opinions that actually has real authorities. Of course, the Al-Sabah family dominates, the emir is the head of the state, but there's really a good bit. There's a lot of room for representative politics in Kuwait. And that every now and then invites political instability. I mean, just like, frankly, in our own country, right? I mean, just like any other representative system, whenever you got more people participating, you get a little bit of chaos, fair enough. But it is for the better of Kuwait. And then the, this, this kind of um, political system uh, every now and then just, you know, uh, witnesses some instability, just like recently. And you get kind of like in Israel, like, you know, governments coming and going, but, you know, it's something that the Kuwaitis have had for a long time and they've had plenty of experience with, uh, but they have to monitor, you know, and they have to worry about so that it doesn't actually, you know, uh, lead to profound instability. But as far as security threats, it's the usual stuff. It's Iran and its proxies, it's violent extremism in all its forms. Awesome. Thanks for that, Bilal. Um, Stacy or General Garrett, did you guys have anything to add to that? What threats do you think are, are apparent right now to Kuwait? I'll start with General Garrett. Yeah, I think Bilal hit the I think Bilal hit the big ones. I mean, you know, um, my guess is that the Kuwaiti leadership, the Kuwaiti military, um, you know, are laser focused on their border with Iraq um, and paying attention to, you know, what's going north and what's going what's coming south um leveraging you know what we are learning in terms of some of our air defense and counter drone uh work um so i i, I would say that below well, the military and then the you know uh the threat from iranian proxies um so i i, I don't i don't know that i have anything else to add there stacy not on this i think you guys have covered it Thanks so much. We have a couple of questions that have come up from the audience. So I'm going to start with um, one that was directed at Bilal. Uh-oh. <laughs> Which reads, if Iran is the threat we have to contend with in the future, what are your thoughts on having a large concentrated U.S. footprint in Kuwait close to the front line of potential conflict? Right. So look, I tried to steer you know, stay away from that subject in my paper because the point of the paper really was not to opine on the numbers on the military presence in Kuwait, I was really more focused on what we're doing with it, okay? That said, I recognize we got 13,000 people in Kuwait, okay? That's a lot of people. That immediately brings up the issue of force protection in the event of a major contingency. And I bet you that every single CENTCOM commander since the days of whoever came after Norman Schwarzkopf, okay? They've had to worry about that very issue, which is why CENTCOM has been very much cautious about any kind of conflict with the Iranians, because we've got a lot of people in the region, okay? And that's precisely why we've been debating and talking about for some time now, how we can diversify, how we can enhance force protection, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of good, as Mike said, that comes out of our footprint in Kuwait. But do we need 13,000 people? No. To me, what's far more important is what we're doing with these folks. Absolutely. Well, and I know that, um, you know, General Corolla is, is focused on that as well. Hey, Stacey, I know that you've thought deeply about what the posture could look like over there um, in the future, if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. And I think Bolo is exactly right about thinking about what we should be doing rather than what is exactly positioned there. Um, I'm going to uh, ride off the coattails of some of my smart colleagues, Becca Wasser and Alan Goldenberg, who had a report when less is more looking at the Middle East posture. But I think it's really important if the U.S. is going to be recalibrating its presence in this reason to do so really systematically and not uh, hastily and to make sure that it, what it maintains in the region is the most sensible given the threats that are faced and what is needed to help with integrated deterrence with allies and partners and security cooperation. So I'd first think through what's not needed. And when you look at Kuwait, um, something that I don't think has been necessary, given the threats we faced, has been the BCT, the uh, preposition set. Um, and it's also one that's in high demand potentially in other regions, either for Korea or more, much more likely Europe, since they're only 
I'm not sure exactly, Mike can correct me, um, nine, I think, active duty ABCTs in the Army right now. So I would move that. I don't think that's critical to our relationship, and I don't think that's a huge uh, change in what we're doing. Um, what else does the United States have too much of in the region? And when you look at the Persian Gulf, um, there are a number of very capable air bases that have been built up and uh, where the U.S. maintains an expeditionary um, air squadron or wing. And there's probably more than is actually needed given the state of current operations today, which while continuing with an inherent resolve are considerably less than they were in the past. Um, so where, which one, do, which ones do you want to keep? Which ones do you want to keep in sort of a warm status or a more cold status? Do you need to rotate as many um, aircraft there all the time? Um, and then think about the things that are really essential for um, the threats that we face in the region and new ways that we can approach them. So something that I do think is important and that we saw which enhanced U.S. responsiveness with inherent resolve and when uh, the Obama administration finally decided to intervene against ISIS in 2014 was having our sent there, that headquarters that was able to quickly expand and to um, command and control a joint task force um, was a huge capability. Now today the Air Force has also um, built up an expeditionary joint headquarters, which I think is their ninth Air Force, but you know, that is something that um, could be useful if we need to ramp up again. And also seems like it could be really useful from the perspective of security cooperation with the Kuwaitis if we want to be doing, uh, working on integration and jointness with them, having that headquarters there that can, you know, be involved in training and exercises um, could be a critical component of it. That's great, Stacey. Thanks for that really, really comprehensive response. Um, that it brings up kind of the dichotomy of a lot of these countries, and you know, Kuwait included, with what they think they need, you know, capabilities and training wise, versus what we think that they need, um, versus uh, what what the threat actually dictates. You know, and those are three separate things, and they are often in tension, um, especially because. FMS is owned, you know, as we know, by the State Department and then DOD's over there doing certain training under a different title. You know, there's there's so many competing um, issues. But General Garrett, I will just, you know, with your expertise over there, what do you think that the U.S. should focus on when it comes to the U.S. Kuwait, you know, posture and relationship? What kind of equipment, what kind of training are they best suited for right now, especially as they try to pursue a more joint force? Yeah, again, you know, I am... Um... And I get beat up for it often, but, you know, I think it all starts with soldiers who are, you know, physically fit, proficient, uh, and then units that can execute small tasks. Because if you have platoons and companies that can't fight, uh, what quickly happens is a tactical or operational response turns into something uh, theater or strategic. Um, and so, you know, Stacy, what we have been doing um you know, the APS, and, and I think this is around the world, although I'm more familiar, you know, with what's in the Middle East, you know, that thing is under constant review. Uh, and, you know, it really reflects, you know, the current APS set uh, reflects uh, today's threat and future threats. Uh, and so they're always making adjustments uh, to those. Um, you know, the Armor Brigade, for instance, it's in Kuwait, uh, you're right. It, we probably don't need an armor brigade in Kuwait, uh, but we need armor in the Middle East because of all of the countries there that are fighting our main battle tank. Um, and again, I say it starts with training uh, and we have to have common systems you know, to train on. And so there's always, I think, going to be a requirement uh, for us to maintain uh, some level of armor capability. And during my watch, uh, as the arson commander, we were beginning to draw down, you know, that brigade to something that looked like a task force that better reflected uh, the requirements, both the operational requirements and then the security cooperation requirements, right? So, you know, Bilal was talking about Eager Lion. Um, you know, when, when we go to Eager Lion, we take tanks, we take Bradleys, we take uh, artillery systems, we take air defense systems. And so I think maintaining a presence that allows us to uh, continue uh, to train with 
uh, our allies to share, you know, what is special about uh, the United States military. And I would argue that's our uh, non-commissioned officer corps. Uh, but to share those things with our partners, I think, on a day-to-day -day basis uh, is going to be even more important going forward. The, the last thing I would tell you is, you know, when General Milley um, uh, stood up our security force assistance brigades, uh, it was really for a couple of reasons. It was really to reduce some of the pressure. I mean, we were sending entire brigades, for instance, into Iraq, but we only really needed the leadership. So you had a 5,000 person organization and we were taking the leadership away uh, to do this very complex leader heavy mission uh, in Iraq and Syria uh, and Afghanistan. Uh, and, and what that was doing, that was not it was not sustainable. And so our security force assistance brigades came in to do a number of things for us. But what we are starting to see in all of the combatant commands, and quite frankly, CENTCOM is the last one. I mean, it is, you know, CENTCOM has, has transitioning the security force assistance brigade that supports them from, you know, specific missions and requirements to what we see uh, in other combatant commands. And that is providing at the operational level and below, um, training, uh, oversight, uh, you know, um, interaction on a day-to-day -day basis that I think is going to help us going forward as well. Yeah, General Gary, I'll ask one follow-up question that kind of goes to what you were just speaking about. Uh, in all of your travels, especially as the Arsenal Commander, is there a an, an Arab military out there right now that you believe Kuwait can kind of model their jointness after that you've seen be successful in kind of bringing the services together, a la Goldwater Nichols? Yeah, um, yeah, I would say the United Arab. I would say the UAE. Uh, the UAE has a true joint force, um, but I would also tell you that um, you know although. Uh, you know, we spent a lot of time with uh, Saudi Arabia and they have incredible capability. I tell you, you know, they've been at it with Yemen now for, I don't know, uh, six, seven years and they have grained. Yeah, seven years. And, and I tell you, they have grown and gained uh, a joint force um, like no other in the Middle East. Uh, you know, the other piece is it's, it's also interesting. Um, you know, it's one thing to talk about. Uh, to have someone assess a military and give you a sense of their capability based on the equipment that they have. It's a whole nother thing to be able, as I was able to do for 42 months, and that is to intimately interact with units uh, from the tactical, you know, to the operational level and to see where real expertise lied. And, um, you know, there were some countries that surprised me and in some cases disappointed me, uh, but the UAE, uh, I think has always kind of been, uh, or at least in my travels, uh, you know, kind of the best joint model, uh, especially there on the Arab Peninsula. That's what Ukraine told us, right, Mike? It's not just about equipment. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And again, you know, I and, and I got beat up about this when I went into Forcecom, you know, responsible for most of the operational army when I said, hey, my focus is going to be on excellence at the small unit level, because that's where it all starts. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of people who try to run before they can walk. Uh, and it's, it's to your earlier point, Bilal, I mean, you can buy the, the Qataris, for instance, and I love the Qataris. They bought the best, they bought two brigades worth of the best German uh, equipment that you could buy. But guess what? <laughs> they weren't, they didn't have the opportunity to train on it, you know, at the uh, individual and small unit level. Great. We have a uh, question from the audience, and this is for Major General Retired Dave San Clemente, who gives a shout out to General Garrett. Uh, he was the SDO dad out in Kuwait a few years ago. He is asking about um, your thoughts on the downgrading of some of the senior defense official defense attache ranks from general officers down to colonel. So I'll pitch that to you first, General Garrett, and then also out to Bilal and Stacy, just as we look at, you know, where we where we are positioning senior leaders, strategic leaders. Um, you know, what do we think about taking them out of embassies and the and what that does to the relationship? So, General Garrett, over to you first. Yeah, thanks. And Bluto, uh, hope all is is going well with you. And look, I think this goes back to um, you know recalibrating uh, our global presence, um, and everybody matters, right? Diplomats matter, uh, and in this case, our military diplomats. 
uh, and we only have so many of them. There are only so many general officers. And um, for the longest time, you know, I think there was a general officer in China, there's a general officer in Russia, there's a general officer in India, and there were several general officers, one in Egypt, uh, one, in, I mean, hell, Bluto was the, as a brigadier, Air Force brigadier, he was the SDO there in Kuwait. Um, and so what I think this is, this is our rebalancing, recalibrating uh, our global uh, posture. Uh, in this case, we're talking about diplomats. And, you know, the, the bottom line is we don't have an endless supply of these. We have to, you know, we're going to do what's in our best interest and we're going to prioritize those countries where we think our most senior leaders need to be. Uh, and, you know, as we've seen over time, we will figure out either diplomatically uh, in the region, you know, how to assuage any current or future fears that uh, our relationship is is uh, in any way we're downgrading a relationship by putting a colonel, you know, into a position that was uh, a brigadier general. Thanks, General Garrett. Over to um, Bilal about that. No, that's beautifully said, comprehensive. I really have nothing to add. And Stacey, anything from your perspective? Nope. No, there, there's, a, there's a bunch of articles out there actually right now that, that speak to this. And I saw a great one, I think written by an Air Force colonel that, that talked about, you know, it's not the downgrading that matters. It's actually just empowering the colonel that's there. And if they're right. a good one, it, you know, it, it's, it's rank independent. Um, and they were able to maintain these relationships for the better part of, you know, two or three decades without detriment. And oftentimes, you know, being just a colonel or just no six that actually comes with a little bit of power sometimes um, because you don't have the, the strategic kind of fallout to think about. Um, so we are approaching the end of this panel. Um, I will throw it out to first to General Garrett for any closing comments and then to Stacy, and then we'll end with Bilal. So General Garrett. No, Katie, thanks and Bilal. Uh, thanks for, you know, allowing me to sit in on this and, and as, you know, I'll just end where I started. Um, you know, I have uh, a lot of respect for the Kuwaiti military. Um, and, and again, when I think of Kuwait uh, and when I think of my dear friend, what I think of, uh, and it should probably be, you know, a picture under the definition of reliable partner. Um, uh, and so again, Katie, thanks. And Bilal, thanks, Katie, or Katie, uh, Stacy, Bilal, thank you all very much. <laughs> Uh, also grateful for the opportunity to participate. I think that, um, you know, we're in the uh, midst of a period of some change and change is always uncomfortable. Um, and it's something that you don't know necessarily what's going to follow, but there are ways that the relationship uh, between the United States and Kuwait that can change for the better um, on the military side and that they should work on shaping it so that it meets you know, the mutual goals that they both have and actually is better suited to the security environment that we face today and are likely to face in the future. And Bilal, over to you. All right. Well, look, I, I may have sounded harsh towards the Kuwaitis, but I've known them for more than 20 years. Okay. And so I recognize the unique opportunity there. That's why I'm I'm being a little bit, hopefully, constructively critical because I want us to tap into that potential. There is, as Mike said, there is no relationship in that part of the world that is really based on trust uh, more than the U.S.-Kuwait relationship. For, really, it just doesn't change. I mean, they have so much faith in us. Maybe they should have less faith in us, but they have so much faith in us, regardless of what's happening in the region, regardless of our politics, regardless of who's occupying the Oval Office. And this is just really something that we should cherish, but we should also not take for granted. So recognizing the opportunity, that's why I'm a little bit harsh. And that's why I want us to elevate this uh, uh, security relationship because we can, simply because we can. It's just that it requires a little bit more policy coherence in Washington and CENTCOM is working on it. So CENTCOM needs that kind of support. So let me just thank Stacy and Mike, uh, and of course, Katie, to you for your excellent moderating job. Thanks so much, Bilal, and thanks to the audience for joining us to talk about a strategic partner, both geographically and figuratively, that Kuwait is. Um, we hope you guys continue to join in. And